Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to this Friday, October 7th edition of the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm Aaron Dyke sitting in as Alex is in Dallas right now leading a protest against the Federal Reserve, dubbed the Occupy the Federal Reserve protest. If you're anywhere in the area, please join him. The address is 2200 North Pearl Street in Dallas. And again, he's going to be at the Houston branch tomorrow, October 8th at 1801 Allen Parkway at noon and in San Antonio on Sunday, October 9th from 10 to noon. So join him if you can. Check the Alex Jones channel on YouTube for continued coverage of those rallies and let's occupy the Fed. Now, coming up tonight, we have an interview with Oath Keepers founder Stuart Rhodes as he tells us about his call for people to join Occupy the Fed protests. And we also have an exclusive interview, part two, from what you saw last night with G. Edward Griffin. Alex asked him about the collectivist government and the move to in the Federal Reserve. But first, the news. Now, the State Department has said, don't invade the privacy of cleric Anwar al-Laki, who was on the CIA kill list. Uh, we know that's, of course, because the war on terror is fraudulent and phony, and they don't want to disclose the many connections between al-Laki and the system. For instance, it's known that he dined at the Pentagon with top brass. But the government has said it refuses to release the records for the terror leader, who is well known to be the first American that the U.S. government has greenlighted to be killed or captured. Now, furthermore, a secret panel has said it can now put Americans on a kill list, further eroding the protections of the Constitution, and it says there is no public record of the operations or decisions of the panel, which is a subset of the National Security Council, or how they come to their decision. Neither is there any law establishing its existence or setting out the rules by which it is supposed to operate, and even the role of the president is fuzzy in how these decisions were made. Now, it's no surprise that the National Security Council set up under the 1947 National Security Act would continue to be extremely secretive, but it's a very bad sign. Uh, they're really a backdoor for the elitists who secretly run this country. It's no surprise they don't want to disclose what's going on, but we need to pressure them nonetheless not to operate the government in secret and not to have ad hoc rule of foreign policy. Meanwhile, the predator drone fleets, which took out Anwar al-Awlaki in Yemen, have been hijacked by a computer virus, and the government does not know why and cannot get it out. We keep wiping it off, they say, and it keeps coming back, says a source familiar with the network infection, one of three that told Danger Room about the virus. We think it's benign, but we just don't know. Now, this has taken place nearly two weeks ago uh, at the Creech Air Force Base in Nevada. The military's host base security system doesn't know why it's happening and has tried to remove it multiple times, but they cannot. Uh, we don't know what this is going to be. We're going to keep an eye on the story, but it may well be another, quote, mole inside the government subverting the chain of military command. More reasons why having computerized drones is dangerous foreign policy and we need to try to hold them accountable. In economic news, Fitch slices Spain and Italy's credit rate rating as the EU crisis deepens. Italy and Spain are embroiled in the region's debt crisis and are reliant on European Central Bank to buy out their government bonds to prevent yields from rising to unsustainable levels, and thus they've been downgraded Italy from double A minus to A plus and Spain from double A plus to double A minus signaling just further problems for the European Union as even the currency itself threatens to unravel where there will be greater globalist control we can only imagine. Now the Occupy Wall Street protests have been further co-opted by democratic Factions as MoveOn.org hijacks the Occupy to push Obama tax agenda. That's a story from Paul Joseph Watson pointing out how the George Soros-funded outfit hopes to turn the Occupy Wall Street protesters into an Obama campaign re-election tool on platforms like taxing the middle class and rich, while the elitists themselves remain offshore, unaccountable to any taxing system. 
And it's really dangerous because Obama clearly is hoping that though he's politically dead at the moment, he could be revived by a populist movement and kind of trigger a class warfare scenario. That is something that Rand Paul has also warned about. This story is on the Drudge Report tonight. Rand Paul, Obama's rhetoric could turn Occupy Wall Street protest violent. And we have a clip here. We're going to check out his words right now. Senator as Rand Paul. As far as this uh, Occupy Wall Street movement goes, you know, I see it sort of like a Paris mob. I, th I see the president's rhetoric of envy and inf inflaming the public and saying, go get yours because rich people don't deserve it. I see it as inflaming this Paris mob that I hope doesn't ultimately result in a lawlessness where they say, well, gosh, those uh, nice iPads through the window should be mine, and why don't I throw a brick through the window to get them? Because rich people don't deserve to have them when I can't have one. Now, Rand Paul is warning because, of course, Obama and the Democratic factions are trying to hijack the Occupy Wall Street protests for themselves. These protests uh, do not have a center, and there's a very diverse group of people, none of them with central aims or goals. And they've been largely nonviolent, but there is always that possibility that things could become more violent. I know there's been many suspected provocateurs as clashes with police have risen a little bit, and there's been tensions. We want to remind everyone that nonviolence is the way, and we want to have a big debate about what to do about this economic crisis. We want to educate people about ending the Federal Reserve as they're angry about what's happening on Wall Street and throughout the country. And we need to keep it civil, of course. We hope nothing becomes further violent. Now, we've seen Herman Cain rising in the polls. He's become really, at this moment, according to the most recent polls, the leader of the GOP race for 2012. He's now been polled at 20 points ahead of even Mitt Romney. And he has kind of that Tea Party coloration, but at the same time, he has been an establishment minion and creature of the Federal Reserve, himself being director of the Kansas City branch of the Federal Reserve. It really has spoken out against calls to audit the Fed and hold it into accountable. Let's play that clip right now. The Federal Reserve already has so many internal audits, audits it's ridiculous. I don't know where, why people think we're going to learn this great amount of information by auditing the Federal Reserve. There's no hidden secrets going on in the Federal Reserve to my knowledge. And I tell people, you know, we've got 12 Federal Reserve banks. You find out which district you're in, call them up and go from there. Now, what Herman Cain is saying here is absolutely ridiculous, and he's just running a smokescreen for the Federal Reserve System, which is holding this country hostage. If you're an individual, sure, you can call up the Federal Reserve and take a tour, and they'll tell you a few nice things, but the important message here is that even Congress cannot find out what's going on at the Federal Reserve because they're secretive and unaccountable. You've seen Ron Paul trying to rein in Ben Bernanke and others from the Federal Reserve, and you've seen Senator Sanders being told no from Ben Bernanke. No, we won't tell you where the money went. That, Herman Cain, is why the Fed needs to be audited. And furthermore, they're not friendly if you just show up at the Federal Reserve Bank. We did show up there two years ago, uh, unplanned, unannounced, just to film the building at the Kansas City Federal Reserve where Herman Cain worked. And we were threatened with arrest just for filming the building. We have that clip now. Now, just to explain what's going on in this video, myself and reporter jo Rob Jacobson were outside the Kansas City Federal Reserve uh, not on their property, but several hundred yards away in a World War I memorial public park. Yet we were threatened with arrest just for failing to identify, we were, quote, doing nothing wrong, just filming the Federal Reserve Bank. The Federal Bank heard about you guys taking video of their building. They just want to make sure we were I'm yeah. sorry? We were just seeing who you were and what you were doing. Uh, what's your name? Uh, my name's Aaron. Okay. And we're just. You're fine. You're not We're just doing checking out this wrong. memorial. So. You're not doing anything wrong, okay? What's your last name, sir? Uh, I'm not going to give you my last name. What are you doing, sir? What you guys can do right now. And you're police but officers or security here. officers? We are some protection officers here. Uh -huh. And because you're not cooperating in you, I asked you a simple question. You're not doing anything wrong. You're videotaping. So. That's right. Right. Yeah. Come on, guys. Let's go. Guys, let's go. Now, uh, why do I have to leave? Because you're with them. Where's the property in? Up there. Well, if he gave his name, then he doesn't have to leave. He did give his name, but okay. it's kind of...
kind of guilt by association. You guys can go ahead and go. What is guilt by association? Sir, we're not going to answer any more questions. You can go to jail or you can leave. Are you a police officer, sir? We do have arrest powers. Do you want to go to jail? Am I under arrest? No, you're not under arrest. Not yet. You need to leave. You're encroaching on our First Amendment right. No, we are not. Why not? Who, this is public property. We have a right. Go ahead and go. Now. Now, these petty authorities were violating a number of constitutional protections, including the First Amendment, the Fourth Amendment, the Fifth, and others. But as you heard at the beginning of the clip, it's a little hard to understand if it's the first time you have seen this clip. The Federal Reserve Bank at Kansas City called up these private security guards and told them to come interrogate us and get our names. We know it's not the only time the Federal Reserve has been spying on its political opposition who remain peaceful to this day. In 2008, in the Fed protests, including the one Alex then attended at the Dallas Federal Reserve, were spied on by Army personnel. We also know that the Federal Reserve has began tracking bloggers on Facebook and trying to identify key bloggers and monitor conversations about ending the Federal Reserve. I think that those facts say a lot about why we're not going to learn what's going on at the Fed without a lot more political pressure. And that is, again, why you should join the Occupy the Federal Reserve movement right now. And just a quick reminder, Alex is currently at the Occupy the Fed event at the Dallas Federal Reserve in Dallas, Texas. Join him if you're within the area, and he'll again be at the Houston branch tomorrow Saturday and the San Antonio branch Sunday. Join him there or join him in spirit at Federal Reserve locations everywhere. Now, we sent reporter Rob Jacobson to New York City this week to cover the Occupy Wall Street protest. And he found what really amounts to a very di diverse group of people there for different reasons. And we really need to reach out to those Occupy Wall Street people and try to show them that the Federal Reserve is the most central, most important issue of the larger economic crisis debate. Let's roll some of that footage right now. This is Rob Jacobson for Infowars.com. I'm standing here at the Occupy Wall Street event. This is the day that the unions are supposed to show up. What we've been finding over the last couple of days is that there is no one central organized structure here, no one message. All the reports on the news showing communist signs, we have not really been able to find many. It is my estimation that the news has been cherry picking very selectively, showing communist kind of rhetoric. It's few and far between people talking like that. Have you seen any communist signs that they've been showing on places like CNN or other media outlets yeah and then I see a lot of socialism signs and then a the guy has a don't tread me flag everybody brings their own sort of whatever over here this is a movement that is really non-sectarian and and a lot of the the cult left the sectarian left uh, has tried to come here and sort of hijack the movement if I start saying I, I'm a communist or so, you know right away 99 percent of the uh, average citizens in the country are immediately hostile I think the, the government and the bankers, we just need to tell them to go sit down and we can do it ourselves. If you want to know what's going on down here, get your ass off your couch, come down here and talk to people. You don't have to sit there and have it be interpreted to you by uh, social purveyors, by economic purveyors who are going to break it down for the masses. People are pissed off and they came down here looking for the truth. You know, if the news picks up on one and just zooms in and just keeps it there, you can't believe it. It's just going to be a lot of science all over. What is your feelings on a communist solution? It's ridiculous. I don't agree with any of them. Five minutes! Five minutes! We're going to start marching! There you have it, folks. They just announced the march will start in five minutes. We'll keep you up to date. All day! All week! All all week. Occupy Wall Street! All day! All week! Do you feel that a communist solution is the answer? No. No, of course. Wall Street. We've been to communist countries and they're not happy places to be. And the stuff that we're angry about, it's all the same. I don't care if you're, you're a Democrat, Libertarian, we're done with the labels. A lot of people are saying smash quote unquote capitalism. Do you agree with that? Uh, no, no. Um, we're, I'm hoping that through this there comes some sort of um, some sort of not an answer, but some sort of uh, I don't know, maybe making way towards an answer, that solution. I don't think it's that easy to say. 
So as you can see, it's a very di diverse group of protesters, many of them well outside of the left-right paradigm. And we've seen that. Many of the protests around the country under the Occupy banner, whether it be in San Francisco or in Dallas yesterday, have embraced the in the Federal Reserve message and are participating in the occupation of the Federal Reserve branches around the country. And we want to continue to welcome people of all stripes. Ending the Federal Reserve is not a partisan issue, although we have seen the Democrats and Obama trying to co-opt this general movement into back into the left-right paradigm, just as the Tea Party movement was co-opted back into the GOP. We want to break through all that as much as possible and remind people that the Federal Reserve is the important issue. Now today, Occupy Austin people here in town had a demonstration down at the city council and reporter Darren McBreen found that many of them also embraced the in the Federal Reserve message, the Occupy the Fed. Let's check out that footage now. We're here in front of City Hall in Austin, Texas, where Occupy Wall Street protesters have gathered here to, well, to Occupy Austin. Now, these demonstrations have quickly spread across the country. They're growing larger in scale and emerging internationally. Meanwhile, the ruling elite have been hard at work in their attempt to co-op the movement by sending in their usual suspects to divert the impact of the Occupy Wall Street protest away from the real cause of our economic fallout, the Federal Reserve. I think we should focus on ending the Fed because that's really who's enabling the crooks on Wall Street to get away with the money. It's a private corporation. It has, it's subject to absolutely no regulation, no oversight, and no representation. It's what allows the machine to go forward, right? It's, it's what feeds, uh, it feeds government, and uh, it impoverishes the people. They are a for-profit group of bankers, not a part of the federal government, as the deceptive name federal suggests. That's why they want to keep us stupid. Federal Reserve is a very complicated thing, so let the politicians worry about it. You simple people don't worry about it. We got everything taken care of. That's their message. I'm against the Federal Reserve because I don't want them to print worthless money. We need to go back to a standard where our money is, stands for something, like it stands for actual goods like gold and silver. They're giving bailouts to Wall Street, to foreign banks, to foreign corporations. And if you look at the, his Obama's appointments, Federal Reserve Chairman Ben Bernanke, Treasury Secretary Timothy Geithner, these guys engineered the financial collapse in the year 2008, and they should not be in charge. And we need to start standing up and, and showing them that the real message here is not just in Wall Street, in the Fed. This morning, President Obama in a press conference said that he sympathized with the Occupy Wall Street protesters. Now, is it a gimmick? Is he just blowing smoke up our... President Sotoro, Obama? Yeah, it's a gimmick. The banksters of Wall Street and the Federal Reserve got him into office. So how can he be against the people that put him into office? It doesn't make any sense. So yeah, it's a gimmick. Where do you think President Obama stands on this? Do you think he's with the Occupy Wall Street protesters? Um, I mean, I think that he understands that there's a huge issue we have. Um, he came into office with a lot of problems already. Um, under his belt and then the way that it's been handled since he's been in office has not really been the best way possible. Where do you think President Obama stands as far as the Occupy Wall Street protest across the country? I think he's scared shitless. He appointed Ben Bernanke from, from Lehman Brothers or Goldman Sachs. That's like letting the fox in the hen house. The immediate removal of Obama is necessary. We cannot wait for, the, for an election to come. Problem is the political parties pander to the Federal Reserve System to work with the, within our government, and so we never get past that, that, that model, that example, that paradigm, as we say. And so it very well could be the start of the second American Revolution. So you're here respecting everybody's First Amendment right? Absolutely, absolutely. If you, if you look around here, uh, the interesting thing, I see half of these activists, I, we know. We, okay. we interact with them. They're met residents of Austin, and what we want to make sure is that we keep our residents that are exercising their constitutional rights safe you always get nervous about somebody from the outside trying to come in and cause problems. So you don't expect any trouble today? No, not in Austin. Not you know, Austin, Texas, 
shows and our activists show how to do things. Right. You know, you don't let your approach, your message get lost in your approach. Uh, we're peaceful, man. We're about keeping it weird, but most important, we're about keeping it safe. And that's why we're one of the safest cities in the country. I'm really proud of the people out here. Anything you want to say to Alex Jones? Uh, you tell Alex, Alex, I have not seen you. I haven't heard from you. Call me. You called me a communist Cuban the other day, and I want to talk to you about it. <laughs> we'll do. See you, All Alex. Right, Thanks, Art. Thanks for implementing unconstitutional blood draw checks for DUI checkpoints and other unconstitutional measures. Uh, but of course, the police were allowing the protests to go forward, people to have their First Amendment. But that image you see of the binoculars surveying the public, that's the image of the establishment everywhere in cities all across the country being very concerned, watching with extreme caution that not only is there an anger against Wall Street and the financial system in general, but that it's beginning to swell around the issue of the Federal Reserve and it needs to continue to be. So I want to urge you again to embrace the Federal Reserve issue wherever you are and occupy that issue if you're going to occupy anything and participate in that. Now coming up after the break, we do have Stuart Rhodes, founder of Oath Keepers, on why his organization is joining in the Occupy Wall Street and Occupy Federal Reserve movements. And we also have a never-before-seen second part of the interview with G. Edward Griffin that Alex recorded yesterday and that he saw part one of on the Nightly News last night. So stay tuned for that. We'll be back in just a moment. InfoWars Nightly News. Obama is notoriously a liar. We need to go to where the real architecture of government is, and it's not in a president. Wall Street has hijacked Washington in broad daylight. Well, Obama's already fudging. He's yeah. fudged since day one in this election. The elite are using Obama to pacify the public so they can usher in the North American Union by stealth, launch a new Cold War, and continue the occupation of Iraq and Afghanistan. The globalists are outside all the nations. That gives them safety, and they play countries off against each other. You've got to give them a stake in creating the kind of uh, uh, world order that I think all of us would like to see. Partnership and cooperation among nations is not a choice. It is the only way. What they're doing is using the existence of the United States to act out their Wall Street fantasies of world domination and maintaining their capital structures and maintaining their system of looting. The fight that this country has been waging since its inception is for the central bankers not to take over the country. President Barack Obama is only the tool of a larger agenda. Senator Obama had a desire to do some meetings. Others have a desire to meet with him tonight in a private way, and that's what we're doing. Presidential candidate Barack Obama was publicly criticizing the North American Free Trade Agreement in a bid for votes, but privately telling Canadian officials not to worry about it. If you talk to our generals, they are desperate for is a civilian uh, counterpart to our military force. What do you call this thing where you get this false sense of gratification, but because a black man is in office, everything's going to be all right? No, everything's not going to be all right. So I know how unpopular it is to be seen as helping banks right now, especially when everyone is suffering in part from their bad decisions. I promise you, I get it. The Obama deception. The truth strikes back. Get your copy of The Obama Deception today at InfoWars.com or download it in super high quality at PrisonPlanet.tv. Okay, we are back, and as you see, the Occupy Wall Street movement's a, a diverse group of people. There's no central pillars or anything, but at the same time, the establishment is trying to steer that momentum into more big government solutions. And you've heard Alex calling for an Occupy the Federal Reserve movement. He's in Dallas today to get that going, but many other groups have had the same idea really at the same time because they're also freedom-loving groups. So we're going to talk now with Stuart Rhodes, the founder of Oath Keepers, and a project that Oath Keepers has been working on with many other people as well, and that is Occupy the Federal Reserve Now. 
and we're here to discuss why they're there, what they stand for, and what message they hope to send to the Occupy Wall Street crowd and the whole world that's watching right now. Stuart, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me on. Glad to be here. Uh, so tell us about how this movement got started and uh, where Oath Keepers and other freedom-loving patriots plan to show up and, and, of course, about the message we're trying to send. Well, as you said, I think we all have the same idea, which is a no-brainer that the real target should be the Federal Reserve. And certainly Wall Street is corrupt and, and complicit, but it's the Fed that's the, that's the heart of the beast and the engine of our destruction. And so just as Alex had that epiphany and and uh, same with myself, and, and turns out Danny Pinzalo, uh, leader of the Truth Squad, had the same idea. And so we've kind of just come together and founded a, a new, new website called OccupyTheFedNow.com. And it's a coalition of volunteers from Bryce Shanka from the 10th Amendment Center is going to help. Stephen Vincent, founder of End the Fed, is going to help. Gary Franchi, uh, Bob Dwyer from the Boston Tea Party Movement. Uh, Danny Pinzala and Brandon Smith from MeltMarket.com are all coming together to and anybody else who wants to join, who's, as long as they're freedom-minded and constitutionalists, they're welcome to help us. And the whole mission is to go out there in the street and counter the propaganda that's, you know, that, that's like you said. Same thing happened to the Tea Party movement. It's now happening to this on the left. They have people who are independents or who are just really, really just warning what's going on and they're angry. Um, and the establishment would like to steer them into, well, just keep voting Democrat or just yell at the bankers, but they don't really want them to look at the real, the real enemy, the Federal Reserve. And so the whole goal is get out there, like Alex has already advocated, get out there and redirect their attention to the Fed. And uh, we'll be reaching out to them. In fact, we already have done that. Oath Keepers in L.A., in Boston, in Seattle, across the country have already stepped out and talked to a lot of these protesters, and they're not dyed the wool communists or socialists. A lot of them are just confused college students who, like most, you know, most Americans, were never taught the Constitution, never taught about free market economics, and just don't know. So, you know, the power elites um, have always had a monopoly on these people through education. They've mon monopolized public education, and then when they go to college, they get an extra dose of it because the college is dominated by Marxists. That's the last refuge of Marxism. So no surprise they don't know what the free market's all about. And so rather than just condemning them like a lot of people on the conservative side are doing, that's a mistake. Get out there and, and give them the information. And, and as far as Oath Keepers goes, we look at it like this. The same reason why we still talk to the military and police even after the gross violations and, and, and gun confiscation during Katrina, and we could have said, hey, look at them. They don't know the Constitution. They don't understand their oath. Forget them. But we didn't say that. We said, hey, we got to go cure that lack of knowledge. And the same is true here. Don't forsake them. Don't cast them aside. That's what the power elites want you to do. They want you to say, oh, there's a bunch of commies. Don't go, don't go talk to those people. You know, I'm not trying to change the mind of Van Jones or... You know, Michael Michael Moore, but he also shows up who's a died in the wool Marxist. You're not going to change your minds. Well, we've had um, reporters down in Wall Street and at the other Occupy events that are taking place across the country, and they all say it's. It's not just socialist or anything like that. It's, a lot of people are wanting to end the Fed, and a lot of people are simply angry about the economic conditions in general. But to me, this seems like a great education opportunity for this end the Fed movement that's been going on at least since 2007 when Ron Paul was running for the GOP nomination last term. And this is a continuation of our efforts while everyone's focused on the economic issues as everything comes to a head. Yeah, exactly. You're going to get, you know, just like, just as disintegration of economies in Tunisia and Greece and elsewhere led to mass protests, you're going to get it. You know, no matter what you, what you, whether you like it or not, there's going to be people in the streets who are going to be angry and upset and scared. So why not get out there if you're a constitutionalist and, uh, and a real believer in freedom? You have an obligation and duty to get out there and talk to them and show them the correct path. Stuart, I hear uh, the message you're trying to say here today that we're just freedom-loving people who want to restore the Constitution. We know that the Tea Party movement from several years ago uh, ultimately became an opportunity for the GOP to stir people back into the establishment two-party paradigm. And we know people like Al Gore, who've called for an Arab Spring in America, would like to drive that same energy to the Democratic Party. And I think it's great that we're out there just to say that, no, this anger about economic issues is an anger against the establishment. Your take, sir. Yeah, I, I see it like uh, they're competing crime families. 
you know, the, the, um, the, un- the oath-breaking, unconstitutional status on the political left are the mirror image of their counterparts on the political right, and they're just competing for domination. And both of them are outside the Constitution, way outside the bounds. And so we need to, to you know, bring the people to the Constitution and to the principles of sound money and, and uh, you know, fundamental liberty that, that our Constitution was, was structured on. Yeah, the final point on. is, uh, as we've seen more uh, accountability, as we've seen more spotlight on the Federal Reserve as an issue unto itself, we've seen Americans become really greatly in favor of not only auditing, but of reining in or abolishing the Federal Reserve. But counter to that, we've seen the Federal Reserve go on the offensive, uh, trying to keep track of, quote, key bloggers on places like Facebook, and really trying to put out their counter message. Uh, We don't want to be intimidated. We want to let people know that it's okay to go out there and speak for the First Amendment. And uh, please address that and the fact that you said the police really need to remember to respect these protesters, because everyone, regardless of their point of view, has a right to voice uh, what they think is going wrong in this country. Well, this, this is the key battle. If, you, if you're afraid to step out now, then you're never going to step out. So, you know, so you got to get out there and not let yourself be intimidated because if you don't step out now and direct the energy that's out there towards the actual enemy, the Fed, if you don't do that, then you're not going to have a country. And so what, then what are you going to do? You know, where are you going to go? Canada? So, you know, be a man, be a woman, step up, do what you have to do. And yes, another fast factor why we're going to be doing this as well is, is to defend the rights of, of, the, of the protesters. And we don't agree with a lot of what they're saying. A lot of things are coming out of these assemblies, you know, is a reflection of their education. Uh, we don't agree with those viewpoints, but still they have a right to free speech. And I think the pepper spraying on the street up there of the women who were just, st- just standing on the street corner was atrocious. They should sue. You know, it's the same thing as like when, when Rob Dew was arrested, you know, at the G20 just for being a journalist. It was wrong. That's why I'm helping with his lawsuit. Um, you have to fight back against this stuff, and we need to stand up um, for the rights of free speech and assembly for everybody, no matter what their political view. Well, Stuart, we're going to leave it there. We really appreciate you joining us. We're going to say goodbye right now, and we really hope that individuals, wherever you are, will go out to Fed locations. Uh, we take you now to part two of the interview Alex conducted with G. Edward Griffin. We are part of it last night, and we're going to show you the rest right now on the collectivist system and who's behind the banking powers. We're joined by G. Edward Griffin. Uh, we're about to conduct part two of the interview uh, that we uh, aired part one of on Wednesday. Again, it is October 7th, 2011. Uh, while you're watching this news program, I'm actually in Dallas now, uh, part of Occupy, the Fed movement that we've launched so that the collectivists aren't able to demonize free market capitalism as the problem. We want to directly challenge the monopoly capitalists who are actually the enemies of the general public having property. Uh, they want a neo-feudalistic surf system. And we talked about that in part one of the interview posted at PrisonPlanet.tv and for the general public at the Alex Jones channel on YouTube. But now we're going to get into solutions with G. Edward Griffin, uh, but I also want to get into problem, reaction, solution. So we're going to cover Cover that first. G. Edward, uh, fast and furious. Now we learn it's more like Iran Contra. Uh, I covered it earlier on the Wednesday show, uh, where it's admitted that the U.S. government allows drugs to be shipped in by select cartels, then actually ships them the guns, doesn't just allow them to leave gun shops, and then gives it to cartels to wipe out their enemy and then recycle the crisis and blame the Second Amendment for it. Now the Attorney General has been caught perjuring himself. But I noticed that Issa and others are saying, come in and change your testimony. We understand it was a mistake because we've learned that Fast and Furious under another name is at least five and a half years old and goes back to the Bush administration, allowing the Sinaloa cartel to bring in drugs in exchange for protection and guns to wipe out their enemies. And that is actually in Hawaiian papers, Texas papers, El Paso Times, but it's not getting national attention. I think this is one of the most red-handed examples of problem, reaction, solution I've ever seen. So your view on Fast and Furious and how important problem, reaction, solution has been in history. Well, it's certainly been important, hasn't it, Alex, in our history in America, because for many years, uh, actually long before the first Bush administration, the, there have been forces within the United States government who have wanted to have an excuse 
to change the character of the government and the character of life in the United States. This goes back actually uh, uh, to the turn of the last century. Uh, you may be familiar, we came across the testimony of Norman Dodd, uh, who was the chief investigator of the um, tax-exempt foundations shortly after the end of World War II. And his testimony was absolutely stunning because he interviewed the heads of some of the largest tax-exempt foundations of the country at that time. And we're talking about the Carnegie Endowment Fund for International Peace. We're talking about the Ford Foundation and the Rockefeller Foundations and so forth, the big giants. And his testimony was startling because he found out that these foundations were deliberately spending huge amounts of money to create crises to to uh, to create conditions of chaos inside the United States as a stimulus to the American mind so that they would be willing to accept drastic changes in the way we live their goal as expressed by uh, I think his name was Norman Gaither at the time one of the big foundation heads he said oh, Mr. Dodd is it what our instructions are our motive our goal is to change life inside the United States so that it could be comfortably merged with the Soviet Union. Now, this was his exact words, and Dodd said that he almost fell off his chair when he heard that. He said, how in the heck can anybody in their right mind expect to change life in the United States so that it could be merged with the Soviet Union and by inference with all of the other nations of the world, especially of them, many of them being dictatorial in nature? That means that the United States would have to give up its cherished freedoms, its judicial system, its way of life. It's, it's everything that we cherish, freedom of speech, our rights, and so forth. And the answer came was that well, they'll be glad to do that if it's seen by them as a means of protecting them against a, a dreaded enemy of some kind. And so the Carnegie Endowment Fund and all these other groups decided that they would do everything they could to manipulate the United States into war and to keep us in war for as long as possible because under conditions of warfare with a dreaded enemy always portrayed to us we are in fact willing to give up all of those cherished things well that was back in the 1940s that he discovered all of this and now here it is uh here it is 2011 and all of the things that Norman Dodge said, that'll never happen. They, they could never bring about those changes. It's already happened. What's the difference between life in the United States today right, at, a, at a deep level uh, and, and all of the totalitarian systems of the world? There's so little difference anymore. And those differences are being uh, whittled away as we speak. So it's actually come to pass. And as you say, it's problem and it's solution. Uh, you know, it's we create a problem, then we offer a solution and then we move and that creates a problem in itself and we have another solution and each little step along the way moves us closer and closer to the ultimate goal well the ultimate goal as I've said before is to change life inside the United States so it can be comfortably merged with all of the nations of the world regardless of their of their sociological economic uh, or political uh, characteristics to bring about this new world order as they like to describe it this is the goal Goal. And it's a, it's the kind of a new world order that I'm sure most Americans would not like if they fully could understand it and perceive what it is. So, yeah, it's it's a definite strategy. It's a tactic. It's not just happening by blind, random forces of history at all. It's been planned and it's being executed in exactly that fashion. It certainly is, and 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 we've got to counter them. I mean, never before has it been more obvious how criminal. Uh, these elites are, and and that they're gaining monopoly control through government, and then they ha they fund the opposition to call for more government, which is like throwing, you know, the rabbit into the briar patch. Oh, please don't throw me in there. Uh, looking forward into the future, uh, I, I mean, I see a lot of uh, uh, hope because people really are waking up quick. Those that can be reached. I mean, I really see kind of a dichotomy or a paradox where either people are getting more you know, uh, into the trance and deeply asleep or they're getting more awake. So I see a, a clash coming. Well, you certainly are correct on that. Excuse me for my phone ringing. I keep putting it on uh, 
on hold, but it doesn't seem to stick. Hey, it's anyway. real. It's real, G. Ever we love it. <laughs> it's very real. My phone rings all the time here. I wish I could just unplug it. But anyway, uh, yeah, uh, where were we? Um, I was getting into the fact that there's a clash of... of oh, yeah, the uh, clash, of course, yeah. I think what we see is, is the, we see the... On the encouraging side, we see a rising tide of public awareness. And that's very encouraging. But we also see on the other side a rising tide of totalitarianism. And these forces are rising at the same time. And it's sort of nip and tuck to see which one is going to overpower the other. I believe that the answer to that question will definitely be known within our lifetime. Certainly your lifetime, probably mine. In other words, it's not too far away. It's coming to a head. G. Edward... Uh Continuing along that line, the authoritarians, the collectivists, do know we're waking up to them. They admit that in their own Cass Sunstein White House memos. They're scared. They're concerned. And I think that's the most important message here is that they're not all powerful. They can be beaten. They try to teach us that resistance is futile like the corporate Borg uh, in Star Trek. But every man, woman, and child, every religion, every race, every group out there needs to realize that every little thing they do towards liberty and freedom and waking others up and resisting uh, adds together to defeat the collectivist. So it's like our free will by doing little actions adds to a, a, a liberty collective uh, and, and, and an individual collective that they can't track or control that isn't cookie cutter that is going to defeat uh, their Borg system. Well, I agree with that. And also there's another element, Alex, and you've heard me talk about it a lot, and that is that knowledge by itself and even sheer numbers by themselves, as important as they are, are not as important as what you do with that knowledge and what positions those numbers hold, the people that represent those numbers. What positions do they hold in society? In other words, do they have power? Are they running things? Do they have, do, are they leaders? Do people follow them and listen to them? Or are they just uh, sort of rank and file? And so one of my big themes with the organization that uh, we founded called Freedom Force International is to motivate people to network together so that they can help each other come into positions of leadership and influence in society. We call it coming to power. Coming to power is more important, well, it's certainly more important than just knowing what's going on. I mean, you can watch what's going on and complain, wring your hands and say, oh, my goodness, this is terrible. I wonder how it's going to turn out. Well, or that's what the CFR, that's what the CFR is all about. As you know, British Intel set it up to take over the U.S. again in 1922, mm -hmm. is they go out and recruit already prominent people and offer them more power to be part of this structure where they admit they're trying to create this continuity uh, of agenda, and there's this idea that the establishment puts out that freedom fighters are supposed to live in a ditch, talk to people over to tin can, and have no power. No, it's the opposite. We have to build media organizations. We have to give to Ron Paul. We have to give to Freedom Force. We have to give our time, our energy, spreading the word. We have to be strong so that we have the armaments in the info war to meet this enemy, and we've got to run for office. And even if you don't win the first three or four times, you are educating people through that process and spurring others. And I think, I think that's been my greatest contribution. I would say that's probably been your greatest contribution is that you have educated whole new generations of people that understand what's happening. I've interviewed people who go out and protest the Fed. You know, one guy with a baby carriage with his child in it, and, and the cops came out and harassed him. The next time there were 200. Now there's thousands in New York showing up, and he's all over you know, national TV now. I, I know I'm nothing special. I've experienced the power of the individual saying, I am not going to submit. And when you have the right information, the moral high ground, and you take action, and you attempt to build a structure or infiltrate their structure to destroy it, you, you're unstoppable. We can build liberty while sabotaging tyranny from within. Well, you're, I, I agree with that totally, Alex. And one of the things we're doing in um, Freedom Force International is that we're offering a free training program, and it's magnificent on how to run for office and how to win. And we just started that about four months ago and already we have people writing in and telling us we're following your plan and we have won elective positions in our local communities we're talking about 
running for the school board, running for city hall. Uh, one fellow is running for mayor. Uh, these are little things, but it's just the beginning. And this is how individuals can leverage themselves and actually begin to take back the power centers of society. But you have to get off of your couches. You have to go out in the streets. You have to go into the election uh, uh, polls. You have to go out there and campaign. You have to get away from the comfort zone that you live in and go out where the people are and pr offer your leadership. And that is beginning to happen. And this is the thing, if anything should scare uh, the collectivists who have pretty much, they think they've got it locked down right now. If anything should scare them, I think it's that thing, that there are thousands or tens of thousands of little people coming up and saying, I'm just not going to sit here on the sidelines anymore. I'm going to reach for power and I'm going to knock some of these guys off of their pedestals. So and in closing, happening. very well said, something else happens. The tyrants, in many cases, will try to persecute good people for nothing. And that validates, wow, we've really got a tyranny. And other people around you will then see the tyranny and will join you. So a lot of us have to be martyrs in big ways and little ways. The tree of liberty has to be watered by the blood of patriots and tyrants. And it has to be watered with our sweat, our tears, our toil. And I can't think of anybody out there in the last uh, five decades who's been toiling are, uh, harder than you, G. Edward Griffin. God bless you, my friend, and thank you for spending so much time with us today. Thank you, Alex, and, and uh, I'm with you all the way. We're all in this together. We'll all hang together or hang separate. We're out of time. Uh, wish us well. Uh, say a prayer for us at our uh, Occupy the Fed in Dallas, Houston, and San Antonio, and other parts of the country. This mission's success is in your hands, so don't just say a prayer for us. Get out there and take right action against these tyrants. They are not invincible. In fact, they're weak. They are only empowered when we sit idle. Our weakness is their strength. Our strength is their defeat. We'll see you back, Lord willing, live this Sunday, 4 to 6 p.m. for the Sunday radio show, and back Monday, 11 a.m. And there's free audio streams at InfoWars.com if you don't have a local AMREF in your area. And then obviously here with InfoWars Nightly News. I want to thank Aaron Dykes for doing the uh, live part of the show earlier. And again, this was second part of the interview uh, I did on Wednesday with G. Edward Griffin. I'm Alex Jones signing off from the Info War.